Okay, did you have a good break? Ready? So any questions before I delve into that? So uh, considering what we discussed last time about what kind of paper you are writing, analytical, expository, and the third one was argumentative, right? So which one would this fall into? Slightly analytical, but mostly expository because we are already stating the fact, right? The male dominance in a society is a major factor behind domestic violence against women. Right? So it would probably be more of an explanation how and when and in what way, right? But how can we make it, now this is a very general thesis, right? How can we make it more specific? So now it is in Pakistani society, male dominance is is a major factor behind domestic violence violence against women. Right? That's slightly more specific. Uh, now, for how, how how can we make it slightly more? sophisticated. Right now it still comes across as a general statement, right? Uh, can we use something other than male dominance? Pardon me? <laughs> okay, so there's one option we have is uh, Remember, you're writing a scholarly article, right? So your thesis has to be in that vocabulary. So, uh, in Pakistani society, patriarchy is a major factor behind domestic violence. Do we need against women? Because if you're writing within that discourse, domestic violence usually is always against women, right? So we don't really need that. So now you have a very succinct thesis, which is slightly specific. In Pakistani society, patriarchy is a major factor behind domestic violence. So what happens when we move from male dominance to patriarchy? What kind of a room for discussion does it create? You can turn that off. Good, good, good. I mean, you're on the right track. You can make a comparison of patriarchy with the system. Good, another good point. But also, when you're dealing with male dominance, you're just probably your essay just one aspect, but there is a patriarchy, it can be cultural hegemony. Absolutely. Then you're, on a conceptual level, patriarchy is a more complex concept. So it doesn't just deal with men, it also will then deal with what establishes a patriarchal social system. Are there certain religious discourses that are being mobilized? Are there some cultural discourses that are being mobilized? Are, are, are there some class-based discourses that... So patriarchy then carries the burden of more in it as a term, and that allows you to focus on all aspects of a patriarchal social structure, right? Um, now, here's another thing. Okay, now this is a very succinct, straight thesis, right? How would you make it a thesis? Because at the end of the day, if it's a persuasive article, you're trying to reach the very subjects who are the dominant group, right? So in an argument, 
if you just bash it on their head, chances are men are just going to look at you and say, you're a feminist, we don't practically care about it. So how do you make it seductive, right? How do you make it into a thesis that men who read and may not be into equality of sexes or whatever you want to call it, would actually read it and be persuaded by your argument? You know, at the end of the day, you know, this kind of discourse always presupposes a rational discourse where the other party is at least willing to hear you out, right? But sometimes your title automatically tells them whether to read it or not, right? So if we are in the cultural specificity of in Pakistani society, how can we, um, how can we make it a case from within? your own culture for the rights of women and their protection. So just imagine I'm a conservative man, I'm very religious, and you're trying to convince me as a female scholar that what I do in an average day, the way I consider women inferior from me or whatever, is against the logic of my own belief system. Right? If you argue that the women in France are equal to men, well, to a certain audience that doesn't mean anything. That's actually a terrible thing, right? So when you're arguing for change in your own culture, you have to then come to your own people through the logic of their own culture, right? So if we wanted to make it more specific, oh. Patriarchy in a way is uh, against, uh, patriarchy leading to domestic violence is against Islamic norms. That's another, good, okay, yeah. So that kind of basically says that the patriarchal, domestic violence in Pakistani society enabled by patriarchy is against the logic of Islamic norm or customs. So then you've got my attention, right? as a scholar, because you're speaking my language, right? Uh, and there are instances of that, you know, of, this is a very important piece in Islamic social politics. Um, so we already know that the, the dominant discourse always eliminates the dissenting voices. That's how it becomes dominant and totalizing, right? <coughs> So if I asked you what was the most important work published in Urdu in, in India in 1898 about the rights of women, which work would it be? So you're Pakistani scholars, right? So in 1898, Malana Muntaz Ali, who was Imtiaz Ali Taj's father, Imtiaz Ali Taj, who wrote an article in the party place. He wrote a book called Hakuk e right? Uh, now, sadly, our religious scholars have totally eliminated that from our history because it doesn't suit their surface. Now, Alana Muntaz Ali was a, was a really, really acute scholar of Hadith and Quran. He wasn't just a, you know, an average person. And in Hakuk e he argued on two lines of thought. A could is so called an acute argument, rational argument, or a dini argument from the Quran and Hadith. And through those two strands of argument, he totally disproves all the things that are mobilized to suggest that women are subservient to men. And the reason his argument is so persuasive is that he is going into the depth of his own religion to argue that point. Uh, I had the opportunity or privilege of sitting with a lot of religious scholars before I left the Pakistan Army uh, for about two years. And I used to listen to Dr. Saram, but he used to translate one was Tamsura and Nisa, right? Arrijalu ka waruna and Nisa, right? And that's the importance of scholarly work and implications of it. And he would translate it as Mart or Tomber Hakim, right? That was his translation. 
as a scholar. So, 1898, Mahimala Ramadazani had already refuted their translation because his argument was that Kawam, Kahibi, Quran, Me, Hakuma, Kitor, Pestamal, Niwa, Malukia, Kitor, Pestamal, Niwa, Jampe, Allah Kalani, Apo, Hakuma, Kibari, and Hokum, the Eno, and this is Hakuma, is the Malkia, Kawam, is the Malkia. Kawam, Ki means for him the first meaning that's laid out in Arabic dictionaries is, is a sustain, right? a pillar, right? support. So Kavam throughout in all its co uh, cognates means something that supports something. And so if this, if this hall is a building, that those pillars are Kavam, right? they support it. But would you ever look at those pillars and think they are dominant in the building itself, right? So from there, Mulana Muntaz Ali extrapolates that the best translation of the word says that Mart or Tonke sustainers him, right? They are the ones who support them. They are the ones who must take care of them. And a more in-depth elaborate uh, explanation of the ayah would be that they serve them. They are their servants. Right? Now, because of one way of translating um, the same verse, you, by mistranslating one word in it, you can claim that men are hakim over women. With another one, you can claim that no, probably not. Right? It's a reversal. So, if you are arguing against patriarchy, writing in Pakistan, you will have to revisit your feminist discourse. Because in the nationalist politics, in the religious politics, the thought that's coming out from the West has already been made suspect. And so your argument would immediately be defeated by just an ad hominem attack, by just telling you, you know, you're not really a Muslim woman. You're not really uh, a Pakistani woman. You are spouting the philosophies of French I mean, women in American families. So the argument must come from within your own culture. So within your own culture. But if you're publishing it in a Western journal, then this is your counter discourse. You're basically saying, I know my Helena Sixu, right? I know my Lucy Evergay, right? I know Melanie Klein. I've read all of them. You know? But I don't need that to make a feminist claim. There are things, this is very post-colonial, there are things in our own culture, in our own social, sacred, public texts, from where we can argue for our own rights. Right? So that's a kind of scholarship that's grounded in your own culture, in your own tradition. It's more eloquent, more persuasive, and also any good journals and feminist theory would be more interested in this because that's the thought coming out of a Muslim country, out of a Muslim culture, which argues for the women's rights from the point of view of their own culture and religion. So does that make sense? And, uh, but also, you know, just on a side, it's fun to read our own history, especially the history that has been silenced. Uh, I've spent the last two years uh, reading Islamic philosophy, you know, starting from Al Farabi, you know, down to uh, Ibn Rushd, right, Al Ghazali, and all, and you find arguments over there that if I now made in public in Pakistan, I'd probably be stoned to death, you know, and you realize that this is the richness of our thought, but we have eliminated it to a point where all we are left with is just a few structures just hackneyed ideas about what constitutes a good life. But it's our responsibility as scholars to go and retrieve those texts and read them uh, so that we know more about our own history. Okay, who else wants to come and give us another thesis sentence?
Do we have a volunteer? Okay. Meanwhile, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free. Okay, oh, let's let's let, let, let's give a chance to men to be a kind of slightly frightened of us now. Okay. Uh, sir, lucky uh, I, I enjoyed another talk and in Royal Albert Hall, twenty uh, seventh of December two thousand eleven. Um, in that talk, Tony Blair was actually invited, and the, the uh, talk was about role of religion in the construction of a society. And he, and I quote his book, uh, he said that Islam is the first and only religion to give rights to the women. Mm -hmm. Exact words, I'm quoting exact words, Tony Blair. Oh, we don't need Tony Blair to tell us I mean, that. That's, that's what they think about Islam. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, there is some misconception in our society as well, created by mullahs or, or mm -hmm. I don't want to name them, but you understand the fact. But the real fact is that we belong to something else as we portray something else. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I love that argument, but then I also come back and say ships do not sail on the wings of yesterday. I, I, okay? Yeah, we were, you know, the British gave property rights to their women in 1838, I think. Before that, if you were married, your property became the property of your husband, and if your husband died, it would pass on to someone else you couldn't retain it. There is absolutely no doubt about that. We also know the history of European racism, the Holocaust, they've done terrible things, right? The question isn't that. The question is where we are now. Can we create an egalitarian, inclusive, and tolerant society? If we cannot, it's not their fault, right? We have to rethink our culture. We have to rethink our place in the world. But were you done? I, am, I interrupted you, so, yeah. May. May, go ahead, go ahead. We want one silence here. That sounds The thing is that, uh, one of my friends is writing a book named as Junk Religion. Mm -hmm. um, and he's not actually publishing it because of the same uh, threat you are mentioning, who is known mm -hmm. for death. Due to the fact that most of our people, or most of our mullahs, you understand what I'm saying about mullahs, they're mm -hmm. just religious scholars, pretended to be, but they're not. They have actually uh, encapsulated the real, uh, um, the real face of us, which is not what we are. And all these things coming from, uh, I mean, I, I, I went there uh, for an inauguration of a book that was more of a feministic uh, a women who, uh, um, women who actually, uh, I, I can't remember it right now, but it was, she was actually being created by some, something else. All these things, these voices are being heard in the West, which are at the very minimum level. I believe these sort of things happen at about 5% or 1%, but they are hearing all that which is coming to our writers, so portraying a negative face of us over there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For the sake of getting um, I mean, maybe some sort of, uh, I mean, getting money or making bucks. Yeah, that, that's a very valid point that, look, that's, we, you are dealing with contemporary media over here. Same are the media in the United States and Britain. They are corporations. Uh, what do they do? At the end of the day, a media outlet, 40% of what they carry is actually news or some programming. 60% of it has to be advertisement. Now, advertisement rates are decided by your ratings. Right? So if your network has higher ratings, you can charge more for an ad. So at the end of the day, these are profit-earning institutions, right? So of course, what leads, leads, right? So if, if there was a peace march in Islamabad and a bomb blast in Karachi, chances are you start with the bomb blast. That's the nature of media itself. There is also a tradition in the West, there is a whole genre of writing. Actually, my next book, before I started writing the Talibanization, is called uh, The Poetics of Incitement and the Muslim Sacred. Right? 
because there's a whole genre of writing which is into Islam bashing and Muslim bashing, and there is a market for it. Uh, our own authors write in those tropes because they know they'll be able to sell their manuscript and sell the book, right? There is absolutely no doubt about that. These things exist. Uh, those of us who live there and live here, uh, that is our job to constantly challenge those stereotypes, and we do that. If you just read my public writing, you will see that, you know, I always find some time to refute any generalized claims about Islam or about Pakistan. But having said that, uh, as scholars living over here, we also need to figure out ways of creating our voices in the public sphere because the public sphere is being dominated by those with bigger guns and those with the more, more poisonous record. So at the end of the day, and uh, you know, our Taliban brothers or whatever you want to call them, what is their politics? It's politics of death. There is no life in it. There is no love in it. You know, just Ibn Arabi used to say that the muhibba is the concept which comes from the Prophet peace be upon him. And that's what we should emulate, right? But if there is no love in their religion or whatever they practice, then it doesn't matter. Then at the end of the day, the only way you can create a religious society is right? And no spiritual society can be created through force. It has to be voluntary. That's why, despite the fact that I disagree with Jamaat's politics, Maududi Saab's argument was great. He was an incrementalist. He was not a revolutionary. And having read all of his works, what he meant was that there must come a point where the society must itself become Islamic voluntarily, and only then you will be able to establish what he called the hukumat e right? Not the other way around, not top down. But as a scholar, our job is to point out our flaws. Not worrying about how others will see us. There's a beautiful line in Uruvi Chambo's novel called The Devil on the Cross. And in the beginning, he's trying to create the defense for his own work because he knows that he's criticizing his own nation. And he says, you know, when there are holes in my own front yard, what shall I do? Should I cover it with leaves and, and, and suffer the danger of my children falling into it? Or should I lay it bare and say there is a hole in my front yard, right? So as a scholar, that's the choice we make. It's very easy. Whenever I go give public talks in Pakistan, you know, uh, I had a scholar from UNC presented, you know, uh, at International Islamic and you know, every second sentence he said people were clapping. Because there's a bag of cliches that you can throw at any Pakistani audience. What is it? Pakistan is a great country, right? You are the future of the world. All these cliches you can very easily mobilize and get claps, but that's not our function as scholars. Our function is to face the hard truths, right? If we love um, where we live. And, and my connection to Pakistan is integral. No one, I don't, I don't need anyone's permission to be a Pakistani. I can trace, I just visited the graves of my forefathers, and I can trace their graves up to the 600 years behind. I am from this part of the world, whether it's Pakistan or not, so I don't need anyone's permission. But because of that connection, I owe it to people, you know, where my ancestors are buried, where my parents are buried, where I would like to be buried someday, that I, as a scholar, don't just write the seedas about it, but point out what is wrong with us. Because unless we do that, unless we acknowledge what is wrong with us, we cannot fix it. Right? So that's the dilemma of being a scholar. The only difference is you must do it out of love. Right? And it must show in your writing. It shouldn't be spiteful. It shouldn't be hateful. And your writing should itself say that this comes out of love. Right? And that's a very subtle distinction to make in your writing. But I think you all know what I'm talking about. Right? Okay, thank you. So.
the identification of the range of the success of group work in uh, e was it EFL English as a foreign language settings. Okay, good. Uh, so right now, I mean it's a statement, right? But it's not telling us what you want to do with it. So I mean there should be a signature phrase here. The purpose of this research, the purpose of this essay is because right now it's an essay title, right? We want a thesis, right? So the thesis must have a signal phrase. The purpose of this essay is, is the identification of the range of success of group work in EFL settings, right? Um, let's also like clarify it to non-specialists, right? So instead of saying EFL, uh, let's put the whole word here first and then give EFL in brackets so that henceforth when you know when you put EFL they know what you're talking about, right? Um, okay, so what else can we fix it on the level of the sentence? I have a problem with this word. So I've modified it to the purpose of this essay is to identify range of success of group work in EFL sittings. Well, range of success is modifying this noun, right? It doesn't really match. Range of success of student group work. Is it students? So. So the purpose of this essay is to identify the range of success of student group work in EFL settings. EFL settings where? In context of Pakistan. In Pakistan, at what level of education? School level, highest, highest. Middle, high? Second, yes, secondary. Secondary. So, EFL settings at secondary school level in Pakistan, right? Now that also itself is problematic. You know, you have to be specific. Is it the Punjab school board or federal school board, is it army public school? So eventually you will have to have further specifications of your sample population. That you can give probably in a second paragraph. But be as specific as possible. Is it rural schools, government schools, because the, the assessment is going to change according to the specific school system that you're talking about and the grade level. Uh, you cannot do it for the whole of Pakistan because I mean it's a, you need a very vast sample and probably five to ten years to do that. So be very specific. Anything else? So right now our thesis is the purpose of this essay is to identify the range of success of students' group work, student group work in EFL settings at secondary school level in Pakistan. That would even be more specific, you can be Punjab or even be Lahore. Be as specific as, as you can. I mean, it would depend on how big a sample do you have. Right. So actually, if I have uh, an observation, a very keen observation that the group work in uh, language classrooms in Pakistan, uh, that's not the success. Uh, it doesn't actually happen. If this is something that's disturbing my mind, and I want to just probe into it as to how to handle it and practically do it, so this is what I, uh, you know. Good. I mean, so so you're not this dealing with empirical research. 
Your writing kind of a sort of a hybrid essay that's part narrative essay, part personal experience, part research, right? But, uh, yes, sir. Uh, but it should contribute to teaching. Yes. Effective teaching because teaching is very much part of Guru work because I have personally seen uh, even myself at certain times that I wasn't monitoring them as I should have. Good, that's a good point. Now does your thesis tell me you'll be dealing with pedagogical issues? Yes, this is what I uh, so want it will, to jump in. It will have to be in there that you, so you will say instead of Instead of saying the purpose of this essay is to identify, you will have to say to identify the efficacy of the EFL school EFL pedagogy, right? So then you're, you basically are bringing into, and then you can bring your own personal experiences to a little bit of theory. How does it work? But how has it worked in your experience? And then what your conclusions are? To be. But sir, can we apply experimental research here? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Why not? I mean, just mention that it's experimental. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. I think I've bored you enough. So um, I'm not going to force unless uh, some men want to volunteer and put a thesis up here. So, please. Thank you. So the purpose of this research is, is to find out the degree of alignment in the text being taught at highest at the secondary school level and the national curriculum 2006. Okay, so this is a, this will involve a research, right? This will involve gathering surveys, gathering materials, uh, the thesis is good because it is already presupposing that it's speaking to an audience that knows what is National Curriculum 2006. And it's basically, uh, it's not a persuasive thesis, not necessarily uh, an argumentative thesis, it's basically finding your materials. And here is your standard. What what needs to be achieved, and so you're basically comparing it with a standard, right? Uh, all, 
you will need to do is know your sample and know how to come up with your surveys, send them out. Uh, would you be visiting some classes? Would you be looking at how the syllabus is constructed? So that would come in your methodology. So other than that, any other suggestions? Okay, so it's a very clear thesis. Um, so uh, to just make it slightly more sophisticated, I will take out, find out, and just use one word, ascertain, right? So that makes it more compact and you're using better vocabulary. Similarly, you can do some changes here. Line, degree of alignment between the text. So comparison is between text being part and national curriculum. Uh, they need, the, the parallelism needs to be corrected. They either both need to be a noun or they either both need to be a verb. So it's a faulty parallelism, right? So text being taught is an action. National curriculum 2006 is a noun. So one of them needs to be changed. So since we cannot change this, we must change it into a noun. So textbooks, right? Textbooks. So that's like a further fine tuning of it where you go into uh, fixing your parallelisms. So it would now be the purpose of this research is to ascertain the degree of alignment between the text, between the textbook at higher secondary level and the national curriculum 2006. Now you have two norms being compared to each other, right? Okay, thank you. So any final thoughts or questions because there has to be your certificate ceremony also and uh, some break and some informal conversation. It was a very comprehensive one. Uh, this uh, workshop. One thing I wanted to ask you, uh, when you are sending your papers, actually you don't send the paper to some uh, journal or for a conference. First you send your abstract. And both the abstract for call for conference and for the journal are written in a different way. So if you can please show a little light on that. Yeah, good point. Uh, okay, so most conferences will ask you for uh, uh, an abstract before they accept your paper. They always give you uh, a word length. Try to make use of that. You know, fo follow the length, 250 words, 100 words. Then they also give you what are the main, main themes of the conference. Make sure that your abstract aligns with one of the themes. The reason is when they are organizing their panels, they are looking at the abstracts and you, they look at your abstract and they will say, oh, this will fit into this panel, right? So you're making their job easier for you. Also, in an abstract, it should have clearly what you intend to do, right? Don't try to do too much in a conference paper. Remember, at the end of the day, you have 15 minutes. And you can only read about eight pages of a paper. Uh, so make sure that your abstract is not too vague or too ambitious. Be very succinct, very focused, align it with a theme, one of the themes of the conference. And going from there slightly into your papers when you read them, nobody likes someone going on and on. So make sure, some people I have to guide my own graduate students, you look, work with the time you have. If you realize that you, you only have seven minutes left, cut down your paper, leave room for questions. Because the purpose is not to read your whole paper. So that's for the abstract for a conference. Uh, the abstracts for a paper are slightly more technical because you're trying to say what you're doing in that paper and you're also trying to say how you plan to do it. So think of it in this way. What is the function of an abstract in a research published paper? Your authorial information, your institution, and your abstract is part of the metadata of an article in all repositories. 
So when someone looks up your paper online in a database, your name comes up, your title comes up, and your abstract comes up. That abstract should be able to tell a researcher what is your 30-page paper about. Right? So remind yourself of that. Because if it doesn't do that, you might force someone to read something that they weren't expecting. If it's misleading, chances are you're not doing a good service to the profession. So that paper abstract should precisely tell in the required length as to what are you doing in this paper and how do you do that. And, and so that's its purpose. So that's the subtle difference between uh, and the diff another difference is most paper abstracts are written after you've submitted your paper and they ask you, okay, now we need a, an abstract. Whereas for conferences, you have to send in your abstract first. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you so much. It has been a great pleasure and a great honor to visit your campus. And, and I hope that uh, despite the heat and fasting, at least you all, <laughs> Uh, that it has been somewhat useful to you. And feel free to contact me. I've given you my email. Uh, if I can be of any service to you whenever in any stage of your careers, just send me an email, introduce yourselves, and I'll be more than happy to help. And thank you so much. so much audience this is Thank you. 